sit down. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. I welcome all of you. If I were to attempt to thank all who are here, we would spend all of our time doing that. On November 25th, 1692, Governor William Phipps, armed with a new charter for the province of Massachusetts from the British Crown, created a court system whose highest court was then named the Superior Court of Judicature, which we now call the Supreme Judicial Court. Ours is the oldest court in continuous service in the Western Hemisphere, operating under the oldest still functioning written constitution in the world. On this, our 325th anniversary, I am so pleased that we have brought together the four most recent of the 37 justices who have had the privilege of serving as Chief Justice of the SJC. I think it is fair to say that never before in our 325 years of existence have we had four Chief Justices of the SJC speaking at the same event. Much of what I am so proud about in our SJC, the collaborative way we work a difficult legal problem, the respect for precedent, but also the willingness to take a fresh look at our Constitution and common law where it needs to be revisited, recognition that every legal problem is a human problem that affects the lives of real people, is the ethos that I inherited from the three Chief Justices who preceded me, whom I will now introduce, as is our custom, by order of seniority. Chief Justice Herbert Wilkins, who served as an Associate Justice of the SJC from 1972 through 1996, and as Chief Justice from 1996 to 1999. Chief Justice Margaret Marshall, who served as an Associate Justice from 1996 to 1999, and as Chief Justice for 11 years, from 1999 to 2010. And Chief Justice Roderick Ireland, who served as an Associate Justice from 1997 to 2010, and as Chief Justice from 2010 to 2014. I am Chief Justice Ralph Gantz, who has served as an Associate Justice from 2009 to 2014, and as Chief Justice from July 2014 to the present. Collectively, we represent 21 years of service as Chief Justice, and 67 years of service on the SJC. And I'm equally pleased that Tom Ashbrook has agreed to moderate this historic discussion. I generally do not leave work until about 7 p.m. And when I drive home, there is only one radio program that I listen to. <laughs> which turns out to be Tom Ashbrook's on point. <laughs> Thank heavens. Which means that with the possible exception of my wife, he is the only person who I listen to for an hour a day. <laughs> Tom Ashbrook is quite simply a master of his craft, and I shall, know, I shall know hand over the moderation of this session to the master. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Justice Gantz. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here in this beautiful hall with all of you and to be at this historic occasion. 325 years is a long time. Uh, to have all four of you on the dais with us today is wonderful. Uh, representing a court that what began to kind of clean up the Salem witch, witch trial problem and has uh, had a little bit of experience ever since then. Uh, not a fickle court. I see in those 325 years there have been a few changes. In 1780, you changed the name. In 1873, you changed the number of justices. But I can't say that there's been a whole lot of major change apart from that. Uh, I'm happy to be here because at this time in our country's history, the even keel of the courts seems, to my mind in any case, to be more important than ever right now. And the rudder of the Massachusetts courts within our country, the deepest of all. So you are representing a legacy that is more important right now than perhaps at any time in my life. And at 325 years, there's, there's a lot of legacy to think of as we talk today. 
We have an hour. I want to make the most of it. I'm glad to have this terrific crowd, and I hope we can dive right in. And I'd, I'd love to just open with uh, each of you, and the, I guess we'll stick with seniority for a moment here, and then we'll have a wild rumpus. Um, uh, but uh, Chief Justice Wilkins, if you could just share a, a few thoughts on this occasion, 325 years, and, and what's, what's important from your experience as Chief, as Chief Justice, what's important for us to have in mind as we look at this very large anniversary? Well, I've been assigned two minutes uh, <laughs> to cover the court's treatment of the state constitution and its development of the common law. I don't know that I need all my time. <laughs> the Constitution of the Commonwealth is older than the federal Constitution. Our Declaration of Rights is a whole decade plus older than the Federal Bill of Rights, which contains many of the provisions of our Constitution. In recent decades, perhaps the last 30, the court has given special attention to the state constitution and often disagrees with the position taken on substantially the same subject as the court in Washington. The major portion of the disagreement has been in the areas of the criminal law, uh, but there is clearly one blockbuster case in the civil area in the last several years. And often the court can simply say, the common law requires this, we don't have to decide whether the state constitution requires it. As to the common law, if you treat it as everything except the, a statute or a constitutional provision, we had a period of time in the 70s, from 72 to 80, when the court broke the dam of a background of relative inactivity. We created rules for civil, criminal procedure. We developed new rules of professional responsibility. The appeals court was created, taking pressure off the court. And the net result was the court spent a lot of time coming up with new principles of liability which uh, had been largely ignored uh, by the court prior to 1970 or 6970. I think that's probably my two minutes. Uh, <laughs> may I take the liberty, as we sit here 325 years, do you have a sense of a special legacy of the Massachusetts um, High Court, SJC, or this state's legacy among all the states in the Union, is, is there a special character to the jurisprudence, this long stream of decisions of the court that you led? Well, it, you have to cover a period of time. Certainly the great Lemuel Shaw, Chief Justice before the Civil War, was very influential and followed by many other states as he developed the common law to adjust from an agrarian society to an industrial society. Uh, there are ups and down times, I suppose. Uh, I think the activism in the 70s still is part of the court's tradition. There probably are fewer opportunities to develop new principles of liability for various reasons. But it is a respected court. If there were others I would think of, I would say over time, and none of them is perfect for all time, I'd say New Jersey and California. In that triumvirate, Justice Marshall set the table for us from your perspective on this big anniversary. Well, let me segue into it, if I may, Tom, by yes. just following up on your question to, Justice, uh, to Chief Justice Wilkins. For me, the defining moment of what makes this court such a great court is because we were the first written constitution uh, which established a constitutional democracy, which is so different from a parliamentary democracy. We had a Bill of Rights. The con our Constitution starts off with all people are created equal, and we were the first court to consider that. Uh, we had a, a court of five white justices who had served in the prior administration, that is to say, under the king, mm -hmm. and the first case that came before this court was a challenge to slavery. 
all men are created equal, it was in those days. Mm -hmm. These five white men determined that under the new, brand new Massachusetts Constitution, slavery was inconsistent with those words. It was a breathtaking break with the past in many, many respects, and I think it defined what this court has done ever since. The common law has been a very powerful tradition, remains a powerful tradition, but our constitutional jurisprudence is important. Let me turn specifically to my tenure. I was sworn in as Chief Justice in October 1999. Mm. We were on the cusp of a new millennium, and I presided over a court that dealt with all of the challenging consequences that that millennium has brought us. And I would focus on three particular points. First, the face of justice. Second, technology and the changes that it has wrought to our judicial branch as a whole, as it has in the rest of the society. And the third, globalization. And let me just highlight each very quickly. From 1692 to 1961, the justices of this court were white Christians, almost exclusively Protestants. And then we had our first Jewish member on the court. When I came onto this court in 1996, which was almost 45 years later, there was one woman, Jewish, and six men, white. One year after I was Chief Justice, I presided over a court of the following. Four white women, one African man, and two white Catholic men. There wasn't a Protestant in sight. <laughs> And let me tell you, we were different. We were really different. And we had to learn anew. And we had to learn anew inside and outside. Because actually, there were quite a lot of the other groups outside that we had to deal with. And I was the only woman head of a branch of government in this Commonwealth. Second, technology. It has revolutionized our law and our administration. Let me just talk about the substance, the jurisprudential substance of what happens in, in the 21st century. So on the civil side, for example, consider this. Can a posthumously conceived child, a child born after her father has died, enjoy the inheritance rights of her father? Think about that. The common law is a great help. But sometimes judges have to make up the common law because there is no other law, constitutional or otherwise. Or in the, on the criminal side, we all know about DNA and wrongful convictions, but we're now learning so much about the brain and what that is doing to fundamental things like eyewitness identification. We just know so much more. So substantively, we struggle with that all the time. Um, globalization, I would say, around the globe, people watch our judicial proceedings all of the time. We were one of the first courts in the world to have live streaming. And you can go onto the website any time the court is sitting. And you can do that in Timbuktu or Australia or anywhere. And people do that all over the world. And around the globe, judges and lawyers of following our judicial rulings. And not just in the blockbuster case, block, block, what did you call it, Chief? Blockbuster? Blockbuster. <laughs> you probably don't like the word buster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, anyway, I mean, so people know about Goodrich against the Department of Public Health, which was the, which was the case that held that same-sex couples could marry. But even in Chief Justice Wilkins' time, I think you were on the court chief, uh, when the, the so-called case of the Commonwealth against Louise Woodward, uh, which was the British nanny case. I mean, there were television cameras from all over the world. I mean, that is something that the wonderful five 
justices in 1780, to say nothing of the not such good justices in 1692, um, just didn't have to deal with. So it's a heck of a change. Uh, Chief Justice Ireland, your opening thoughts on the, the legacy of this court and your essential learning as the chief. Well, I start with uh, the thought that when I was first asked by Governor Patrick to be Chief Justice, I declined his offer. And uh, I thought that was an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> well, I recall that Chief Justice Wilkins and then later Chief Justice Marshall both uh, urged me to uh, consider taking the position. Uh, and uh, I was still very hesitant because I had been a judge at that point in time for 33 years. I had begun to discuss retirement with my wife. And for me, most importantly, I thought I knew most of the challenges that the next Chief Justice would be facing. <laughs> and I knew TMI. That, and I, I knew the challenges were daunting and almost insurmountable. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, a day at a time, uh, the governor's chief counsel, Mo Cowan, uh, who later became our United States Senator, uh, he spoke to me and he urged me to reconsider and eventually I warmed up to the idea. Uh, I understood there would be challenges facing the third branch and uh, I was afraid that I would not be able to address the challenges successfully. But a day at a time, uh, bit by bit, we were able to address each of the challenges, but it was a struggle for several years just to keep our uh, heads above water. That's what I think about. <laughs> uh, could you speak to those challenges from the outside? We think you come in. Uh, play racquetball, uh, <laughs> hear a case or two, have lunch, write in the margins, make a decision, and go home. Actually, it is a very good job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what, what, what were the challenges that you felt most imposing? Well, let me just say, each chief is confronted with a different set of challenges. Of course. And, of course, we're all very different personalities. We have different strengths and skills. But in my case, there had been a hiring freeze across the state for two years, which meant that court employees were being asked to do their own work as well as the work of their fellow employees when an employee would retire or move or die. That meant that we were asking them to do twice as much work as they had been doing. We were forced to close court sessions because we didn't have sufficient people to keep the court sessions running. There was an event involving the probation department in which there were claims that politically connected candidates were getting jobs. And names, uh, were often mentioned of members of the legislature mm -hmm. in that connection, which meant that the relations between the legislature and the third branch were very, very cool. But the legislature sets the budget for the court system. And so we had a very difficult time keeping our heads afloat. At one point, um, the uh, Supreme Judicial Court proposed that there be a moratorium on filling judicial appointments, um, which didn't go over very well with the executive branch. I'm sure not. Yeah, yeah. Or, or some of the former chief justices. <laughs> <laughs> some, not to be named, but perhaps present. And, and given the situation with the probation department, twice uh, the governor proposed that we move probation into the executive branch of government. Mm. And so that meant twice I had to disagree with him publicly. Yeah. And so relations with the other two branches were really very cool. And as a result of that, um, judges had not had a pay raise for seven years in Massachusetts. So they were not very happy either. So 
um, we just didn't have a constituency that was uh, involved in supporting the third branch of government. Can I ask each of you about the personal experience of doing this job, being Chief Justice in, in the Commonwealth? I mean, it is remarkable that we have four living Chief Justices uh, serving and former. It's wonderful. It's an amazing thing. Uh, Chief Justice Marshall, uh, Chief Ireland, spoke to the makeup of the court. She was the first woman to serve as Chief Justice. You were the first African American. Did that matter? You'd already been a judge for a long time. Did you feel your identity as somehow essential to your work as Chief Justice? Did it inform or guide your own work and how you led the court in a, in a material, personal way? How did you experience the significance of your family background as you served as Chief Justice? Well, that's a great question, first, first of all. And, and the answer is, although I had been a judge for 20 years when I came here as an Associate Justice, I knew that I was not just representing myself, but also my race. I feared that if I was not able to do the job, if I failed, that it would reflect on other people of color. And so it was a personal challenge. I knew that if I could do a good job, then others might be able to follow. But if I failed, if I did a poor job, I feared that would impact on those who came behind me. Now, I sometimes thought of uh, the famous Justice George Lewis Ruffin, who was the first black judge in the United States. He was a judge who sat in Massachusetts, and he was appointed in 1883. He was the first black law school graduate from Harvard Law School. He was a pioneer, and I, I often thought about what he had to deal with when he came on the bench as a judge. I'll also add that I had the uh, great honor of succeeding Judge G. Bruce Robinson in the Boston Juvenile Court. They called him Robbie, and Robbie was the second black judge in Massachusetts. And think about this. He was not appointed until 65 years after Judge Ruffin, 65 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. And so, of course, you think to yourself, you know, this is important that I not just do a good job, I've got to do the best job that I am capable of doing. And uh, a lot is riding on my performance. As, as Chief Justice and across your judicial career, but especially as Chief Justice, sitting at the head of the court that first outlawed slavery in this country, Speak to how your race informed your opinions, informed the way you guided the decisions of the court. Can you, can you well, describe I, the texture of that influence? Well, of course, influence? In, in, in every case, you strive for perfection. You want to get it right. You want to make sure you interpret the laws properly and you understand what the statutes say. But I, I have to say, there were some cases where I understood because of my race, that there might be a different interpretation that, th than what my colleagues might assume about a case because of race. I, I give you an example. Um, yes, please. Well, I don't know if you've ever been stopped by the police for driving, let's well, say, you're white. Speeding. I have not. Okay. I well, mean, I've been stopped by the police, but. I was usually speeding. Well, <laughs> well, well, oftentimes a uh, police report will say the person was nervous, and therefore, because they were nervous, that suggested that they had been doing something that was inappropriate and the mm -hmm. police needed to uh, pursue it further, mm -hmm. and maybe order them out of the car and, and give them a, a frisk and a, mm -hmm. and a search and all. But I have to say, as a black man, if the police pull me over, I'm going to be nervous too. Mm -hmm. And I would be nervous for my children as well. And, and I would not assume uh, criminal behavior. And so for me, 
if the report relied solely on they were fidgety, they were nervous, um, I would take the position with my colleagues that should not be a sufficient basis to uh, support the police stop and search. And hasn't there been a ruling of, of this court that uh, a black man might have a reasonable cause to flee police? Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, Justice Hines, is the author of that opinion, is sitting right in the back there. Yes, she wrote that opinion. Yes. Uh, Justice, Chief Justice Marshall, you went straight to this issue of the diversity of the court as, it, uh, as you found it and as it assembled around you uh, as the chief. Um, speak to the difference that that makes and, and maybe your own personal history and how it impacted your filling of the, the role. I would say, Tom, <clears throat> I'll differentiate here between being the chief justice and being the justice. It's a huge privilege and honor to serve in either capacity. I think I, bring, I brought to it three different perspectives. The first is I am an immigrant and I revere this country. I revere everything that it stands for, and I revere the Massachusetts Constitution as one of its great founding documents. Um, a, sm a small story, when I resigned and stepped down as president of the Boston Bar Association in 1992, I had no idea that I would ever be a judge, and a very nice, smart executive director who's here in the audience, Frank Moran, pulled me aside and said, what would you like us to give you? <laughs> Smart question. Uh, otherwise, you get the Paul Revere bowl, only it's not silver. <laughs> and I said to him, Frank, I would like a picture of the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, and that picture has hung in my office. Um, it did at my law firm. It did at Harvard. It hang in my chambers here uh, whenever we moved. And I think it is because of what this country gave as a gift to the world, which is a form of constitutional democracy with a charter of rights, <clears throat> where um, you, we the people have the rights and the government can't take them away from us. And when we think the government is taking away from us, we have a constitution that says you can't do that. Uh, and no country in the world has followed us until 1948, the German Constitutional Court was the first court to follow us. So you go from 1780 to 1948. So yeah. that really, and so frankly, this is the John Adams Courthouse. This is the first great public building named after one of the greatest statesmen and jurisprudential people in our country. And this is the first courthouse that we are named after him. So that informed me. Second, my history of um, opposing racism in South Africa informed me a great deal, and that's why I like the first slavery decision. And third, as a woman, this country gave me opportunities that no other country had given me. I had one woman serving with me, Ruth Abel. I knew, just like Chief Justice Ireland, the one thing that I had to do was to work as hard as I could to get it as correct as I possibly could, relying on whatever advice I could get, which I did get, so that I didn't fail. I felt that deeply every single day. Um, it, it meant a great deal to me. Did it change my jurisprudence? Probably not that much. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor always says a wise judge who's a woman and a wise judge who's a man will reach the same decision, and I think we all strive to do that. But I felt that history keenly. Um, I am astounded by the, I was astounded by the number of letters that I had from schoolgirls. I mean, we, we didn't have a lot of role models. I mean, that's an overused term, but there weren't many heads of government. There weren't many chief justices. There weren't, there was one, justice uh, on the United States Supreme Court, people were hungry to show that everybody can participate in this great constitutional democracy. And so for me to serve on that court with just um, with so much more representative of our country, our society, and our commonwealth was wonderful. It really was. Did you find it most important for what it represented to the population 
or for how it informed the decisions that your court came to, the diversity of that court. It was less symb symbolic. It was, I remember when I was practicing law, what it felt like to walk into courts room after courts room after courts room after courts room to see pictures of white men who look very old and very different from me. And you will notice in this courthouse, this beautiful Adams courthouse, there are no pictures of the judges in our courts room. Uh, we, we, we the, the, however many years you have spread among us, and I have by far the least, uh, we build on each other. We, we are not individuals. We work collaboratively. But I had another drawback. I had become a judge in 1996. I'd served as a judge for three, count them, three years. I had never worked in a branch of government, ever, state or federal. I knew nothing about the criminal law. Well, not much to speak of. I did one course in law school, and that had been a long time ago. I mean, I had a lot to learn, <clears throat> and I had wonderful people who helped me learn. Uh, and I think what that showed me is what this country has shown me, which is it doesn't matter who you are. You remember turning down Governor Patrick. I, I remember meeting with Governor Weld, who appointed me. Um, I was appointed by Governor Weld and my Governor Salucci. I'm, I'm looking at my now present colleagues because yesterday Justice Kafka was sworn in as one of the latest justice and all we heard about was Governors Weld and Salucci. I had them both. <laughs> so, and I remember, it's so funny in retrospect, I remember meeting with Governor Weld's legal counsel and saying to him, first before I tell you the question, I was married to Anthony Lewis at the time, which was before social media and before mass television. The great New York Times columnist, of The great course, New York Times Anthony columnist. Lewis. He was the, the voice for liberalism, Democratic Party, you know, wacko from, from some people's <laughs> point of view. <laughs> and I remember saying to the governor's legal counsel, D does the governor know to whom I'm married? <laughs> Which, if you happen to know Governor Weld, is like the stupidest question that you can ask him. And I remember his legal counsel saying to me, I think the governor does know to whom you're married. So let me make a point about that. In Massachusetts, we do not have elected judges. It does not matter what your political party is. The political power rests in the hands, the, the, the power to appoint justices rests in the hands of the political branches. Adams put it there, that's where it should be. But um, Justice Ireland was appointed by um, um, a Republican. I was appointed by a Republican. It didn't make any difference. I mean, it, it had, we don't get reelected. I mean, it is a remarkable, uh, a remarkable, brilliant gift that we in Massachusetts have um, that so little of that counts. And so, for example, with a, with a decision which was as divisive as the decision to allow same-sex couples to marry. Goodrich. Goodrich against a pub, a public Depo Department of Public Health. In 2003, you couldn't tell who was a Republican, who was a Dem. It didn't make any difference. It simply didn't make any difference. And Justice Ireland and Chief Justice Wilkins have it so right. You look at the facts, you look at the law, you leave it outside the consultation room, um, we don't even address ourselves by first names. I mean, it's, it's a very deliberative, it is independent judges. It is justices who are trying to do their very best, um, irrespective of their own personal view. So I understand why you keep pressing Chief Justice Island and me on that. It may have made a difference in some respects. I don't think it made any much difference jurisprudentially. Chief Justice Wilkins, um this almost seems like a setup, right? <laughs> now we come to the Chief Justice who was white. <laughs> and and, and I'm whose white. father was Chief Justice, your, your father Raymond. As you, so you came from this legacy where it, it had been literally in the family, uh, and you served, and your service was lauded from all sides. And then we come to the era when the doors opened more widely. How have you observed that? 
Well, I think the first thing you can observe is I'm a member of a dying breed. <laughs> well, yes and no, I would say. But you're taking a very long time to actually bring that about, Chief Justice Wilkins. We are very pleased to very see Very durable breed, I would say. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I really thought seriously about whether or not my colleagues came from one background or another. Mm -hmm. It really didn't matter to me uh, one way or the other. Uh, early on, I'm shifting here, yes. you raised the question of what's the difference from being an associate justice to being a chief justice? Yes. And I think the biggest difference is public relations. You have to deal with, and you should deal with the legislature with real care. Mm -hmm. You should deal with a bar association which has a real role in defending the court when the court can't speak for itself. Uh, you deal with the press which in my experience were very fair and not difficult to deal with. You deal with the public generally, and then you have to deal with your difficult colleagues, of which the people to my left are exhibits A and B. <laughs> <laughs> but we, sur we survived, and it was, it was, it's been collegial. I, I do not recall in my time more than one or two instances where the justices disagreed in a very personal, hostile, kind of argumentative way. Mm -hmm. It was all very much on an intellectual level. And therefore, uh, you can be a good friend with someone who disagrees with you in the substance. What about the experience of being Chief Justice? I don't know if there was any other father-son Chief Justice pairing in the long history of yeah. the SJC. It, it, it probably won't they have a bad experience with it. They won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, you must have watched as your father filled the role, and then you found yourself filling the role. Did it look as though it had changed markedly in its, oh, in yes. its heart? Oh, well, yes. We're in a different, whole different subject here. When he, no. when, when he died, when he, when he left and died a year later, yes. The court in the next year or two changed incredibly in its makeup, in its attitude what to What year was change. that? Forgive me. Well, we'll start with 69 when Arthur Whittemore died. Mm -hmm. In November of 72, I came on. In that period of time, Governor Sargent made six appointments. Mm -hmm. Wow. Two of them were Superior Court judges of great merit, Francis Quirico and Edward Hennessy. Two of them were Harvard Law's former, former Harvard Law professors who had open minds about these subjects because their background, unfortunately, was New York law. But <laughs> they, they learned fairly quickly. And we did a lot of things to change because in my father's time, the theory was, if we're going to change things, the legislature ought to do it. Great, perhaps, in theory, but in practice, not very logical. And so the whole area of law that had been somewhat stultified exploded with expansions in the tort law, with big changes in, I mentioned some of them, administrative matters. The appeals court came along and took the burden off the court of dealing with, yes. with all respects to the appeals court, cases that are not all that important. And, <laughs> Cut, cut. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear about that one. <laughs> Actually, another way Until of- Until you have an appeal to make. Another, another way to put it is- Yes, please. The appeals court does most of our work. <laughs> okay. Um, we don't have elected judges in, in the Commonwealth, just as Chief Marshall. How do you see the impact of that over time? It's very unusual in, in the country, very small number of states. How does that roll out? It's had a huge, it's made a huge difference in the past um, 20 to 25 years, and let me explain. The first elected judges were introduced in the middle of the 19th century, um, and there was an attempt to have elected judges in Massachusetts, and we're sitting in the Adams Courthouse, and I'm looking right across to a beautiful statue of Rufus Choate. There was a constitutional convention here in Massachusetts around that time uh, in the middle of the 19th century where this was a very, very hot topic. Uh, the fear at the time being that the legislature was simply appointing their political hacks to the bench and that the people were not being represented. By the way, in this Commonwealth, that had a lot to do with slavery. 
uh, and elsewhere. There was a fear that people were, um, it, it was sla slavery was one, there were a whole bunch of other issues. Choate, uh, Rufus Choate, gave a brilliant speech, which I have shared with bar associations doing the kind of public education that Chief Justice Wilkins referred to, and law schools and high schools, about why we shouldn't have elected judges. And it goes to the fundamental part of a constitutional democracy, that judges are independent from the will of the people in one sense and the elected representatives in another. In other words, there are minorities that may be property holders, for example. Uh, they may be particular religious believers. They might be uh, people who have a physical disability. I mean, history is replete with how we try to carve up human beings into different categories. And if you feel that you have a grievance, you can go and address the court. Underlying many of your questions, Tom, is a very um, recognizable refrain, which is somehow we have a, you know, Chief Justice Island comes, he must have a black point of view, I come, I must have a women's point of view. Chief Justice Wilkins has a dying breed <laughs> point, point of view. Um, but in fact, what we try to do is to say the judges are independent. And so when you have elected judges, particularly elected, but also reappointed judges, in other words, judges who think they're going to have to face election and therefore will have to rule in decisions that might not be popular decisions, it begins to infect judicial reasoning. Now, why do I say it's become a particular problem at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st? It's because for much of our country's history, people paid very little attention to what judges were doing. So in many states that had elected judges, if you were elected once and you were re-elected and re-elected and re-elected and re-elected, very few judges were not re-elected. Now what we are seeing is that great judges, really wise people, terrific committed justices all over this country, and I've traveled to many states, will, 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 will author a decision, for example, will release somebody from prison or will decide um, you know, some view which is considered unpopular, yes. they will be voted off. And that is, that is the antithesis of what an, in, uh, an independent judiciary means. It doesn't mean that we are not accountable. We are absolutely accountable. We are accountable for in many different ways. I think the court has been and always will be a very transparent court. It's why we do events like this. People can ask us questions. We have plenty of outreach, we have our proceedings publicly available, you can walk into any courthouse at any time, very few people know that. Um, it is a wonderful system and it's one worth protecting. I want to say one last word about Justice, uh, Chief Justice Wilkins' comments about the collegiality of the court. The court is collegial, but the court is collegial internally and externally. And I compare my, ourselves to the United States Supreme Court, where we frequently hear what a collegial group they are. Mm. And then we watch them as they go out into the public and say the most outrageous things about each other. Now, I may be tempted to do that, <laughs> but I simply will not do it. In fact, I'm not even tempted to do it, because how you can sit with your colleagues and respect their points of view, and then say the kinds of things that we have watched justices on the United States Supreme Court say about each other, just, I just find very difficult to understand. So when we say we are a collegial court, we are a collegial court, we are a collegial court to everybody. I mean, our disagreements are jurisprudential disagreements. They are deep disagreements. Um, but there's also a way that we have tried to write opinions. I think Chief Justice um, Gans and Ireland, and I learned a great deal from Chief Justice Wilkins, although I had him for far too short a period of time, which is we don't sling you know, arrows at each other in opinions. We really try not to do that. We try to have people, people understand why we are deciding the case the way we're deciding the case. 
I, I don't really care uh, to use negative epithets. May yes. Up on a Chief. point you were uh, asking about earlier in terms of the elected judges. It costs a lot of money to run for office. Uh, and so to publicize your name and of course. all, and of course, where do you get your money from? You get it from lawyers, and then the lawyer will stand in front of the judge on a case, and there's a conflict there. So um, I know in some states, for example, to run for the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, it costs over a million bucks. That's a lot of fundraising. Exactly. Chief Gantz, um, I don't want to break the spell of collegiality, <laughs> but we live in a hyper-politicized, super-polarized time. How do you see the role of the courts in a time like this, when we not only have great polarization, we have thunderbolts sort of, sort of thrown down from the chief executive of the nation. It, in a highly polarized time, does the role or significance of the court change? Certainly, I, I think back to the 300th, I'm sorry, the, the, the 250th anniversary of the court. I was not here for it. It was 19... I was going to say, you, you have a very good 19, memory. It was 1942, but I, I've actually read the entire deliberations of that proceeding. Uh, it occurred in the midst, of course, of the darkest days of World War II, mm -hmm. uh, and the threats to the rule of law at that time were extraordinarily real and were discussed because of the perceived dictates of wartime right. policy. Uh, I did note... Internment and I so did, on. I did note that as much as there was discussion of the rule of law in 1942, there was not a single mention of the fact of Japanese internment, which wow. had occurred months before that was just the anniversary accepted. of the court. It was, not, it, was not, it was not mentioned during the course of that 250th anniversary. Uh, obviously, we are now faced with different threats to the rule of law. Uh, we have been blessed in this commonwealth with a governor and a legislature who actually is quite respective, uh, respectful of our particular role. In contrast to some states, when we interpret statutes or the Constitution in a manner that they may not be thrilled with, uh, they invariably have respected our decision and have moved on. And one cannot take that for granted from the experience of other states. And myself, especially Chief Justice Marshall, who once was the president of the Conference of Chief Justices, have seen the experiences of other states dealing with that. Uh, but uh, we, are, uh, we are quite mindful of the fact that we are here as guardians of our Constitution. All of us here take that role extraordinarily seriously. We are here as the craftspersons of the common law. The common law is judge-created law, and where it is not clever, every time we cite it, we are essentially reasserting it. And we have to recognize, as Chief Justice Wilkins did with, in his day, that when the common law does not make sense, then we, it is our responsibility to change it. Uh, the, I mentioned legacy. The legacy that has been left is a legacy of willingness to examine issues of the common law from Chief Justice Wilkins' time. It is a legacy of uh, mutual respect. I mean, I do point to everyone who reads uh, Goodrich, mm. read not only the wonderful majority decision of Chief Justice Marshall, which is cited in, which is quoted in many a marriage throughout the world, yes. of gay marriages and heterosexual marriages, but read also the dissents. Uh, the dissents were thoughtful, they were respectful, and compare the tone and language of those dissents to the dissents in Obergefell with regard to the very same issue. They are worlds apart in terms of how they were written. They reflect no, no reduction in rigor, but a view that we are dealing with very difficult, challenging problems, and we're going to honestly confront those problems and respect that. And that is the legacy, which is the culture of the court, which I have inherited. I mean, we do, when we hear a case, we go back in that consultation room and we truly do work the problem. It is a collective effort, and every decision of the court is a collective effort done not only by the author, but by each of the other justices who helped to 
revise and change what we have written. I, I would love, after I write an opinion, for everyone to say, don't change a word. Uh, I don't hear that that often. Uh, uh, but I can truly say that uh, with regard to every opinion well, I have presented to consultation after three, six, eight, ten drafts, uh, when it's published, it is a better decision as a result of the comments and thoughts that I've received from my colleagues. Chief Wilkins, how do you see the role of the courts in our civic life in a time of such polarization and when individual judges around the country are chastised by a, a presidential candidate or the president himself in a time of such politicization? How do you see the unique role of the court in our civic life? Well, I think basically the court is do the best it can to ignore what has happened unless a case comes before it that involves that kind of problem. Uh, if the court tries to resolve outside of writing an opinion, it's way out of the, out of the ballpark of where it ought to be. The court should not get involved in that kind of a mix because it detracts from the appearance of impartiality. Can the court provide stability to this to our civil society when legislative and executive branches may not? The court can only act if it has a case. It may have an occasion to make an individual justice make a speech, but the minute the judge takes sides, that hurts the image of impartiality. So unless the case comes up and it has an issue that relates to what you have described, I don't see courts solving that kind of problem. Chief Marshall, you said in the Goodridge case, our obligation is to define the liberty of all, not to mandate our own moral code. We have a candidate for the United States Senate out of Alabama right now, who, in, in Judge Moore, who famously wanted to put the Ten Commandments in the courthouse and did, uh, and who even now says he puts the Bible above the Constitution, ultimately. How do you look at that kind of voice in our political dialogue in 2017? You're going to take sides now? <laughs> You're a former, former Chief Justice. You have some liberty. Speaking of liberty. First, I would say that there is a difference when you're running for political office and he's not sitting on the bench. Um, and so that makes it very different than my statements earlier where we have elected judges who can be taking the same positions and who will have litigants coming in front of them. That is something that is very different. But I also want to point out that, um, that the candidate for Senate from Alabama has for me a challenge which I don't think is taking sides, Chief Justice Wilkins. What is fundamental about work that is working in our democracy and which I think goes to the core stability, Tom, is what Chief Justice Gantz referred to, which is when judges issue orders or judgments, we as a people obey them. We talk with great pride about how the United States dealt with the United States Supreme Court decision of Bush against Gore and how the people accepted that. You couldn't have made a more politically divisive judgment. And this court hosts jurists from around the world, and a frequently asked question is, how do you get people to enforce your judgments? While he was sitting as a justice, and when another court issued orders, then Chief Justice Moore declined to obey judicial orders. I think that is something which should trouble people because the one thing you do not want in the United States is to have our people not obey judicial decisions, not because we are always right, not because we are always right. We are not always right, but because that is our system of law. There are ways to change our decisions. There are constitutional and legislative and other ways to change our decisions. But I think we embark on a difficult path if you have leaders who disobey judicial orders. We are a branch of government, 
and people can criticize us. They can say terrible things about us. They can call us so-called judges. We may not like it, but that is our democracy. But there has never been a decision, to my knowledge, that has not been obeyed by any governor in this Commonwealth. We have had governors and speakers and all kinds of people disagreeing with our decisions. I think that is absolutely fine. And so that is what I have to say. May I, may I make Please a point here on, on um, Judge Moore? Because it was an elective state, he was playing to the electorate. Uh, he knew that they would support someone who uh, embraced the Ten Commandments. And he knew when he told the uh, trial judges not to uh, obey the same-sex ruling, he knew that the electorate would re-elect him because um, th that played right to their uh, sense of religion and propriety and all. Do you see, just Chief Ireland, given the tenor of our politics today and the tenor of utterances from the executive, from the president, do you see the presumption of enforcement in doubt? Uh, I think it's in question. Uh, I, I, I think reasonable people uh, would reach a conclusion that the, the court decision should be obeyed, but you look around at the times, the tenor of the times, and I think people are suggesting maybe you don't have to follow the laws as much now. And, and if we toppled over that line? Chaos. Uh, Chief Gantz, we live in a time when people talk a lot about fake news, and there is a lot of uh, fact-free argumentation. It strikes me that one of the things that's unique about the court system is that it is evidence-based in a time when that's become relatively rare. What about the significance of that in our civic life today? I, I, I think we have a great deal to teach the public about the way in which we find facts. Uh, the, 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 the nature of evidence is designed precisely to sort out what somebody may have heard and may not be, sure, it may not be, uh, be true from what is good, solid evidence worthy of consideration. Uh, one of the remarkable things about our court system is for a jury trial, we bring in 12 people who've never met each other. We have Republicans, Democrats, men, women, people of all races, colors, creeds coming together to decide in a, in a criminal case whether an individual is guilty or not guilty. And the percentage of times in which those individuals cannot reach a unanimous verdict is 1%. 99% of the times when 12 people come together, guided by the rules of evidence, governed by the law that the judge gives them, they are able to reach a judgment beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously. That says something quite extraordinary, both about the capacity of fair-minded people to do that and of the structure which we have created which enable them to make those collective decisions. Our time begins to grow short. I want to ask each of you, uh, especially the former Chief Justices, because uh, the SJC doesn't set its own budget, yet you have wide responsibilities. The legislature has a lot of influence over what's uh, provided and the parameters in which you work. Um, as you've watched the functioning of the court while you were chief and subsequently, what would you say to the Massachusetts State Legislature about what it ought to take care of when it comes to thinking of the court system? You would like to think that they would pay attention to the recommendations of the court as to how money should be expended and where courthouses should be built, but this is a political system and that doesn't always work out the way the court wants. One doesn't get mad. We had a Chief Justice who had a little bit of a problem about that. Uh, Did you get even? Well, maybe it wasn't a little bit. It was maybe a little bit more than a little bit. Uh, it didn't work. You've got to recognize they call the shots, and there may be a point where the separation of powers principle leads you to, to urge them not to destroy that structure but we have never gotten that far. 
Chief Marshall, what would you say? As I won't put this to Chief Justice Gans, he's the sitting Chief Justice, but <laughs> if, if you could say, speak to the, the state legislature from your experience about where they ought to be nurturing, intending, and focusing, what would you say? I would echo some of Chief Justice Wilkins' things, but I would put it in a somewhat different perspective. I think the problem that our legislature faces is the problem that state legislatures and executive branches all over the country are facing, which is that the, and the fundamental <clears throat> sources of paying for state government are threatened from all sides. And I think we have made enormous strides. That was some of the administrative changes I was talking about. We now have court administrators who are professionals, who know how to do things more efficiently and so on. But I have always found going to the legislature that um, they understand, but they're also trying to pay for broken bridges and broken homes and health facilities and education. So I think we have to be respectful. I think our task is to be able to demonstrate to the legislature and the executive branch that every dollar that they provide to us, and it's not their dollar, it's, your, it's the people's mm -hmm. dollars that they are simply passing through. Every dollar is being spent in the most efficient, most thoughtful way within whatever rules they give us. We may want to change some of those rules. It would be very nice if we could pay, take from the blue box and put it into the red box and move the red box into the green box. They have made a political decision not to do that. Within that framework, we have to show to them that we are doing it as well as we possibly can. And that's terribly important. And I think we are being, doing it because of technology. It's a great gift. We've been able to get the data. I was listening to the governor this morning. I only heard him on the radio saying, you can't make decisions unless you've got the data. I think we've made great strides in getting the data so we can go and demonstrate. I'll give you an example. Uh, the, when I became the Chief Justice, our appeals court was dramatically understaffed. I mean, we could look at the number of justices appointed to the appeals court, and we could look to every single intermediate court in the country to show that the docket simply didn't match. And our, our appeals court justices were not only doing much of the work of the Supreme Judicial Court, they were just doing too much work, frankly. Mm. And we could go to the legislature, working with the chief, then Chief Justice of the Appeals Court and myself and others, to say to them, look, if you look at every other intermediate appeals court in this country, we are just way out of whack. And little by little, we, we could actually demonstrate to them. So I think it's, uh, you have to have respect to the other branches. Would I like it to them to do it differently? Yes, of course I would, but I'm not running in their district, and maybe they don't want to put, tear the courthouse down. Mm. Chief Ireland, your word to the legislature? Well, I would start with this. Some years ago, many members of the legislature were lawyers. They were in the courthouses. They could see for themselves how the courts functioned uh, and sometimes what they needed. Uh, nowadays, we don't have very, members, very many members of the legislature, so they have to be educated about the court system and what it does and how it works. Uh, and so I think it's an educational process. So I often would go to uh, the state house and just knock on a door and say, I'd like to talk to you about the courts, and here's what we're doing, and here are the, here's the structure of the court system. Uh, I, my feeling was the more they know about the courts, the more they would be inclined to be supportive. You know, we have to, we have to try to persuade them to help us do what uh, we have to do. I mean, there's the, con the constitutional relationship, but I think there's also a personal relationship. And the more they know about us, the more they're likely to say, you know what, we need to help the court system do its job. We're going to wrap up in just a couple of minutes here, but we're at the 325th anniversary of this court. That's, that's many years and a, a long legacy of decisions. I want to ask each of you, I'll start with you, Chief Wilkins, to your mind, if this is, I'm a layman, I don't know if this is the right question, but what does Massachusetts jurisprudence stand for most uniquely or most distinctively? Well, I think it's the quality of the work, uh, the care with which opinions are put together, the tradition that is important, uh, that we have a responsibility to carry on the, what we hope was good work, of our predecessors and we hope it will be good work of ourselves.
Chief Marshal, the texture of that tradition, what's most distinctive, most unique in it? I think it is a court that looks constantly to its past, as we should do, and constantly tries to move it a little further forward. The one thing that I was very aware of, and I know Chief Justice Wilkins was, and I know that uh, Chief Justice Island and Chief Justice Gansar, is that when you are placed in this responsible position, you cannot come in and think that you can change everything overnight. Now that is difficult because we are in a give it to me now mood. I mean, we want it now. You know, we get irritated when our Wi-Fi gets interrupted for 10 seconds. Oh, we really do, I do. You know, why isn't picking up, you know, Waze isn't responding fast enough before I get to the traffic light? But I think we do recognize, I mean, you know, we've got a brand new Chief Justice who's spending his few hours leading the constitutional conventions of the 250th anniversary. What on earth were you doing, Chief Justice? <laughs> you know, but he says it as if that's just fine. And none of us blinked an eye. was like, well, of course you're going to read those. And I, you know, I read the constitutional conventions of here, there, and everywhere. And we all read them. I mean, you know, all of us, I mean, you know, you have a copy of the Constitution and it's thumbnailed and I read it at night and sometimes I just open it at any old page and see what it says. I mean, I literally do. Pretty wild. I just love it. And so I think all of us have, and it's not just the Constitution, it is the common law. Um, it is a terrific, but I, but I think what also makes a big difference is we have a fabulous relationship with the bar. We've got great bar associations right across the Commonwealth, and each one of us, I know, has spent time with those bar associations. We respect the people who work in that regard. Uh, we have very good relationships with uh, all of the law schools. We've got great law schools here. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a very um, bubbling kind of legal community, and it's a big legal community very, very big, and I look out and they're different people and we don't look the same. And I, of course, don't know any of the younger lawyers. That means anybody under the age of 60, I don't know. Um, and it's just terrific. I just love it. Chief Ireland, your thoughts on most, what is most important in the, in the tradition, what's most distinctive in the, in the, the jurisprudence tradition of, of the Commonwealth as we reach 325 years? Well, one of the things that I, I'm not sure the public knows about, and, and that is that Whenever a case is argued before our Supreme Judicial Court, all seven of the judges have read all of the briefs and have done their research before a lawyer stands up and says a word about the case. We're considered a hot bench uh, court, and that means the judges are prepared for every case. They, it's like being in graduate, postgraduate school on every case. So by the time we reach a point where we're trying to decide what the conclusion of the case is, everyone has put in a great deal of effort just to be prepared for that one case. That's a great tradition. Chief Justice Gans, you hold the torch right now. As you do this, the work day in and day out, what's foremost in your mind about the significance of the tradition built in this state, in this court, over 325 years that you hope to carry on? tradition of this court system is not only the tradition of the SJC, but the tradition of the entire trial court. Uh, it means the chief justices who are sitting before me, it means the judges, the clerks, the probation officers, the court officers, all of, which, all of whom are important in terms of providing truly equal justice and justice that works. I mean, we are, right now, we are spending a great deal of our time recognizing that we need to be better at providing equal justice. Uh, looking at issues of race, issues of poverty, wanting to ensure that our courthouses are truly available not only for the citizen, but for those who are not citizens, whether documented or undocumented. Uh, we are focused not only on those who have the benefit of counsel, but on those who cannot afford counsel and are appearing in our probate and family courts or our housing courts without counsel, and trying to ensure that they have a decent chance to obtain fair justice. Uh, we are looking to make sure that our court system works in terms of being able to provide a sensible and cost-effective resolution in civil cases. And we are looking and spending a great deal of time on focusing on what 
our court system can do to alleviate the problems that come every day into our court, whether they be problems of drug addiction or mental health or domestic violence. Uh, the governor a few weeks ago declared that a certain day was conflict resolution day. Uh, every day in our courts is conflict <laughs> resolution day. Uh, and the extent to which we are ably and efficiently and sensibly resolving those conflicts is really the work of the court, not only of the SJC, but the work of each and every court in this commonwealth. And I am extraordinarily proud to be the Chief Justice and be involved with Chief Justice Kerry and John Williams. And I see Harry Spence there. It was a great pleasure to see Harry. We welcome him back to our court system. Uh, but we're only the top, we're only the, the point of the needle. Uh, there's an enormous amount of justice that must go on that uh, goes on by the thousands of persons who are part of our court system. It's a very full plate and an extraordinary time at 325 years. Uh, Chief Justices Wilkins and Marshall, Ireland and Gantz. First, we celebrate that you're all here with us. <laughs> the, the most ever, I think, on a stage at one time in, in all those years. That's remarkable in itself, and we celebrate it tonight. We thank you for your time and thoughts in uh, marking this 325th anniversary. It's been an honor to sit with you and with this entire audience here. W would you like to take us out, Chief Gann? Uh, I will. Not quite sure what you mean by that time. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I will do is I will thank the Supreme Judicial Court Historical Society uh, which operates under the auspices of the Social Law Library, who has sponsored this event and who has been good enough to sponsor the refreshments that will follow upstairs for all of us to attend. So if that's what you mean by taking us out, <laughs> yeah, that'll do. I will have done that. But I want to also thank, I want to thank each of the Chief Justices. Uh, some are here at some sacrifice to their, own, to their own personal lives, and I'm grateful that you can all be here, and I'm extraordinarily grateful and we were able to steal you from WBUR for a few hours. So thank you so much, and thanks to everybody who's here. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chiefs. Thank you very much. Happy 325th. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.